one of the things we see a lot more of these days for reasons that those of us in my field are trying to sort out and discuss, and I'm still uncertain about, um, is we're seeing more instances of after parents split up, one or more children in a family coming to have resistance or refusal to spend time with one of the parents. Okay, so we call that a resist refuse phenomena or a problem with post separation parent child contact. Some people call it parent child contact problems. Um, you used the word alienation before, and unfortunately, a lot of lay people, but even some of our colleagues, meaning attorneys and psychologists, unfortunately, look at a parent-child contact problem and more reflexively go to how's the alienation taking place, okay? But parent-child contact problems, resist, refuse, can come by, come by way of numerous pathways. So the first thing that we want to do when a client comes to you, comes to me, one of our colleagues, and reports that a, a, a child or children are refusing to go to their dad's house or won't come to their house, is we want to start by casting a very wide net and think in terms of the multiple pathways by which children come to resist, refuse. I think in terms of three major pathways, and there are some lesser pathways. The first is alienation. Okay, what is alienation? I'm going to define it for you. Alienation is an, is an attempt on the part of parent A to turn a child against parent B with no justifiable basis. Okay, so the key here is with no justifiable basis and that the parent is attempting to do that, that the parent wants that outcome, okay? And, and they may want the outcome for a variety of reasons. We can come back to that, but for now, let's just leave it there. Another pathway is something we call realistic estrangement. Realistic estrangement is when children react to something in the parent that they are resisting, refusing, that is realistic. For example, um, a parent who's very punitive, a parent with a drug or alcohol problem, a parent whose mental illness interferes with their ability to interact with their children, a parent who is not attuned, a parent who is narcissistic, and selfish, and the list goes on, okay? And in those situations, um, the child is reacting to something realistic in, in the parent they're resisting and refusing, and we're less concerned with the motive of the parent that they're aligned with, okay? That parent um, sometimes supports the child's resist, refuse. Sometimes they try to work against the child's resist, refuse. But the realistic estrangement can't take place unless there's something in the parent-child relationship that's realistically amiss, okay? Whereas in alienation, we have both an unrealistic basis and a parent's deliberate wish to cause the disruption, okay? So, the parent's wish in realistic estrangement can make the estrangement worse, can complicate it, can make it more difficult to solve, and can begin to look like alienation. And there may be alienating elements to it. But as long as that child's resist, refuse has an element of reality to it, when I go to my dad's house, uh, he spends all of his time... Uh, you know, on the phone or on the computer and yells at me when I want his attention. Hell yes, that child resists and refuses. The child's protecting him or herself. Okay. It's an adaptive, healthy function. The third major source of resist, refuse, 
And this is what I see in the majority of resist refuse cases is the children responding to the intensity of the parental conflict. So think of it this way. Let me give you a visual. You think of the family, you've got mom, you think of the, you know, the stick figures of a family, mom on one side, dad on one side, each holding hands with the child who's between them, right? So where do we want children in healthy relationships even after divorce? We want them between their parents, aligned with their parents, both of their parents, comfortably. Even if the parents aren't aligned with each other, they support that. When there's a ton of conflict between the parents, think of it this way. These are a mom and a dad involved in a chronic pistol duel, okay? They always have their pistol pointed. It's cocked and ready to go. The kid's in the middle where we want them. That kid now has to look every direction under the sun to see where the rounds are coming from. And they can get hit by rounds coming from both sides, right? They are in constant peril because of the conflict. What does that child do? That child chooses a parent to shield themselves with, and they hide behind one of the two parents. So at least that way, they don't have to look at incoming rounds 360 degrees. And chances are, if there's an incoming round, it won't hit them because they're hiding behind a parent. Okay. So why does the child choose one parent over the other? Well, a lot of reasons. It can be a parent-child temperament match. It can be a more permissive versus a more restrictive parent. A lot of different reasons. But the, the, the source of the resist refuse, where we look to intervene, is the parental conflict. The idea being when the parental conflict dies down, the child doesn't have to be in the middle of a pistol duel anymore and can relax back into a relationship with both parents. Okay, so these are three of the major sources of resist refuse. The one that gets the headlines and the attention is alienation. Um, and in my experience, and I think I'm fair to say the experience of most of my colleagues, alienation is the least likely reason that resist refuse comes about, okay? It's hard to alienate a child from a parent with whom that child has previously shared a good connection, a, a solid, healthy attachment, and reciprocal connectedness between the two parents. It's very difficult to disrupt that bond. Okay, it takes a lot of work, which which is why alienation is so hard to accomplish, and when it happens, can be difficult to unwind. Can you give us some examples where you've testified about evidence of parental alienation as you sure. defined it? Children, well, let me think of a case I, I I did a couple of years ago where these uh, these two children came in and talked to me about. Um, elements of their parents' sexual relationship. Well, how did they come to find out about that? Okay. Turns out in this particular case, the father had a particular sexual fetish that um, was unusual, um, not gross or, or alarming, but unusual. And um, if I were to share it with you, which I won't, because it will reveal the case, um, you would understand that when the children came to hear about this from one of their parents, they were kind of icked out. Okay. Um, so they, they came and talked to me about that. One of the children came in with, a, I interviewed the mother and I said to the mother, you know, um, mother wanted to relocate. Why should Susie relocate with you? Mother gave me her reasons, A, B, C, okay? When I met the kid a few weeks ago and I brought the, the kid into my office, I said to the kid, tell me why you're here. Well, I want to move with my mother, A, B, C. Same narrative, same words, same order, okay? The, the child had taken on the parental perspective and had also been told about the father's sexual stuff. Um, other examples are children who tell stories about, well, let me, let me tell you about a case that, that, that uh, happened quite recently where a child 
told the story of a father who sexually molested her. Okay. And um, uh, in telling the story about how it happened, it would have been physically impossible for, for the parent to have done to the child what the child said the parent did. It just wasn't possible for it to have happened. The body doesn't work that way geometrically. Um, but the, 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 the child had uh, uh, had a, an interaction with the father that they found unpleasant. And the, 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 the child was being punished by the father. Todd didn't like being punished by the father. Um, when the when the punishment was over, the father tickled the child. The child doesn't like being tickled. Went home and told the mother, where did you get tickled? And it went from there. Okay. And then took on that narrative. Okay. Did he do it to you this way? Did he do it to you that way? And there was no realistic basis to the child's assertions. Couldn't have happened. It was the same narrative the mother carried and the father and, and, and the child refused to see the dad. Okay. Um, so those are examples. I, you can know that there, I mean, there's also, there are, there are some strategies that parents can use to brainwash a child. And we sometimes look for those strategies, but also we see in children um, who we know have previously had a good enough relationship with the parent they're now resisting and refusing an inability on their part to articulate strengths of that parent weaknesses of the parent they're aligned with or pleasant memories of the parent that they're now resisting and refusing. They, you know, here are the photographs of the family on vacation at the lake and the dad is teaching the kid how to water ski and the kid looks joyful. Oh, I hated every minute of it. I really wasn't smiling. He made me smile, that kind of stuff. So this is some of the data that we see, but basically Alienation, is, for me at least, is a process of ruling out other causes. Okay, and, and we're left with alienation, and we we typically see a co-parent, a, a, the parent who is the alienating parent, um, usually, if not always, has other resentments towards that parent, power and control struggles with that parent that they're acting out. Now, there's some variance here. I've seen cases where the purportedly alienating parent was very much mistreated during the marriage by the other parent. Carries trauma. Okay, carries trauma and therefore filters what they believe the child may be experiencing with that parent through their trauma. Okay. And so is that true alienation? Well, they may engage in alienating behaviors, disparaging the other parent, not supporting the child's contact with the other parent, not letting that child know when the other parent calls, um, arranging for the child to need to be at a birthday party when they're supposed to be at the other parent's house, things like that. But because there is a realistic basis to that parent's perception of their co-parent based in their own trauma, it's not true alienation. And this is really important because what the real alienation advocates have come up with, and I'm not an alienation advocate, I am a resist, refuse theorist, okay? If it's alienation, it is. If it's realistic estrangement, it is. What the alienation advocates have come up with is if you have an alienating parent, then you have to remove that parent from the life of the child, at least for a period of time that allows the child to normalize their relationship with the other parent. Very draconian, very dramatic, um, very heavy handed. Um, and um, if, if and only if there's true alienation, would I ever want to consider something like that? If that other parent never mistreated little Susie, but did mistreat Susie's mother. And Susie's mother is now reacting to Susie being with her father through her own trauma. That's not true alienation because there's a realistic basis for that parent's perceptions of their co-parent, okay? So I think we need to be really careful about how we label these things because the label that we apply, the diagnosis, if you will, that we apply to the resist refuse speaks to how we intervene. Okay. 
And, you know, if you've only got a bad appendix, you don't go in and get the gallbladder. You just get the appendix, right? We want to make sure we're not taking out a gallbladder instead. I, I used the term alienation advocate before. And um, what I mean by that is people who, if they see resist, refuse, are going to tell you it's alienation um, unless there's abuse going on. Um, and they've come up with something called the five-factor model. And they've also come up with, through alleged purported research, 17 alienating strategies that alienating parents use. I want to caution the viewer and the listener to be skeptical about these things because they are simple solutions to complex problems, especially the 17 alienating strategies. This study was done by a psychologist and the methodological problems with the research are substantial. If the methodology isn't clean, you can't trust the results. And the statistical problems with the study are massive. So I wanna caution the reader that if you come across this literature and the 17 alienating strategies, I think many of us would agree that some of those strategies are there, but I would never agree with you that it's research validated because it's junk science in my opinion. Now, the proponents of that research will, perhaps you'll have them on um, your your channel and they'll, they'll disagree with me, all good. Um, but that's my point of view.